in listen only mode. Hi everybody and welcome to the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC's webinar, Intersection of Acculturation, Acculturative Stress and Contextual Trauma in the Lives of Latina Latino Communities. Today's webinar will be presented by Dr. Miguel Gallardo, Associate Professor of Psychology and Director of Aliento, the Center for Latina and Latino Communities at Pepperdine University. And I would like to let the audience know that this webinar's topic is part of a symposium that the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC will hold at the University of Southern California next week on October 5th. And the symposium is titled Immigration, Trauma, and Substance Use, the Latino Journey to the U.S. I will tell you more about our presenters soon. And here um, is a flyer for our symposium. If you would like to register, we provided a link here for those of you who are interested in attending. During today's webinar, all participants will be muted. The audio will be streamed through the computer. Please make sure your computer speakers are turned on and off to hear today's presentation. I'm going to review a few other housekeeping items. If you notice that your viewer does not fit your screen, you can expand it by clicking the expand button located in the top right corner indicated by the red arrow. Now you'll see that your viewer is expanded to fit the screen. Also, you can collapse the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right of your screen by clicking the small red arrow on the left of the toolbar. And then click the arrow again to expand the toolbar, and it will expand. As I mentioned, for today's webinar, all participants will be muted. As we move through the presentation, if you have a question for a presenter, we ask that you use the chat box on the toolbar. Simply type your question and hit send. Um, we are going to wait till the end of the presentation for questions, and we'll have some time um, for our presenter to answer any questions. A recording of today's webinar along with the PowerPoint slides will be available at our website www.attcnetwork.org slash Hispanic Latino approximately one week from today. You can also find recordings and PowerPoint slides from all our past webinars at the same URL. One NADAC, one NBCC, and one ICNRC continuing education credit is available for those who attend today's live event. So if you're interested in obtaining CEUs from these organizations, please email us at um, HispanicLatinoATTC at U-C-C-A-R-I-B-E dot E-D-U. As I mentioned, today's webinar is sponsored by the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. As of October 1st of 2012, the network has restructured, has been restructured, and now consists of 10 regional ATTCs, four national focus area ATTCs, along with the network coordinating office. As you can see by this map, the ATTC network regions were realigned to better fit the current HHS regions. And the four national focus area ATTCs are listed on the left of the screen. Today's webinar is the 27th in a series that the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC has been offering. The ATTC network is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and serves a critical role in improving the health of the U.S. The network achieves this by translating, disseminating, and promoting the adoption and implementation of evidence-based clinical practices and strives to improve the health and wellness of individuals whose lives have been impacted by substance use disorders. You can learn more about the net network's products and programs by visiting attcnetwork.org. As I mentioned, the ATTC network is funded by SAMHSA. SAMHSA strives to reduce the impact of substance use and mental um, health issues on America's communities through its programs and services and demonstrates that behavioral health is essential to health, that prevention works, treatment is effective, and people recover from mental and substance use disorders. If you want to learn more about SAMHSA, you can visit their website at www.samhsa.gov. So now I'm going to introduce our presenter, Dr. Miguel Gallardo. Dr. Gallardo is an Associate Professor of Psychology and Director of Aliento, the Center for Latino and Latino Communities 
at Pepperdine University. Um, he teaches courses on multicultural and social justice, intimate partner violence, and professional development issues. Dr. Gallardo also, as I mentioned, serves as the director of Aliento um, at Pepperdine University. He's a licensed clinical psychologist and maintains an independent consultation practice where he conducts legal, forensic, medical, and immigration evaluations and psychotherapy with adolescents and adults. In addition, Dr. Gallardo consults with organizations and universities on developing culturally responsive systems. Dr. Gallardo's areas of scholarship and research interests include understanding the psychotherapy process when working with ethnocultural communities, particularly the Latina Latino community, and in understanding the process by which individuals develop cultural awareness and responsiveness. Dr. Gallardo is currently Director of Research and Evaluation for the Multi-Ethnic Collaborative and of Community Agencies, MECA, a nonprofit organization dedicated to serving monolingual Arab, Farsi, Korean, Vietnamese, and Spanish-speaking communities. Dr. Gallardo has published um, referred journals, journal articles, and books book chapters in the areas of multicultural psychology, Latino psychology, and ethics and evidence-based practices. He's a fellow of the American Psychological Association, has established presence among psychologists many associations, including the American Psychological Association, California Latino Psychological Association, the California Psychological Association, and the National Latino Psychological Association. He is a past president president of the California Psychological Association. He's one of the founding members and served as the first president of the California Latino Psychological Association and continues to be active in psychological organizations on the state and national levels. Dr. Gallardo is currently serving a second term governor appointed position on the California Board of Psychology. He has been honored for his dedication and commitment to the field of psychology locally, statewide, and nationally. And we appreciate that he accepted our invitation. Okay, so now we're going to go to our poll questioning. And here is today's first question. Do you currently serve Hispanic and Latino populations with substance use disorders? Okay, 79% say yes, 21% no. Well, are you planning to serve Hispanic and Latino populations with substance use disorders in the next six months? And 88%. 83% say yes, 17% don't know. What is your current professional role? And we have 16% social worker, case manager, 35% counselor, therapist, 14% faculty, researcher student, 9% um, government, and 23% other. <clears throat> what type of setting do you currently work in? And we have 5% academic. 50% treatment, 8% research, 29% government, and 4% other. Now to our pre-post testing. Historical or intergenerational trauma are contributing factors to, to substance use in Latino communities. True or false? And 100% of participants say yes. 
in order for healing to occur for Latino communities, it must occur at the personal, relational, and collective levels. True or false? And we have 96% say true, 4% say false. And there is a third question. Latino youth, Latino, Latina youth who speak Spanish with their parents are less likely to smoke marijuana and use other drugs than those who don't. True or false? And we have 63% say false and 36% say true. Okay. So that's it for our poll questioning. Now I'm going to leave you with our presenter, Dr. Miguel de Gallardo. Okay, great. And do I have a screen at this point? You should have it in. One second. Okay. okay, got it. Perfect. Got it. Okay, good. All right, great. Uh, can, I, can you hear me okay? Is that good? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, thank you for the invitation. I, you know, I know I don't have a whole lot of time today, and uh, I'm going to try to um, really give an overview. I have a lot more information in my PowerPoint presentation today. Um, then I'll go into a lot of detail about. Uh, I just I thought it was important to have information. You'll get this PowerPoint so you can review it and, and go over some of the details later. Uh, I always love the pre-poll questions. This is the second or third time I've done a webinar like this, and, and it's always interesting for me to see um, you know who I'm presenting to and with. Uh, and so it's this is a, you, you're a very educated uh, community that I'm presenting to today. So that's a good thing. Um, so I'm going to try and, and, and really uh, really expand, as, as the title of my presentation um, uh, denotes, expand our perspectives around how we see the intersection of, of acculturated processes, uh, where trauma uh, intersects with that, and then how that can potentially lead to some concerning and maybe potentially unhealthy behaviors. And I talk about it that way because when, when you'll see when I present some information around the literature, there's, there's, you know, I think the literature is consistently inconsistent in some ways. While, while there are some things that continue to surface and, and come up in the literature, there's also, um, you know, some other information that seems to contradict that. And so, um, so I'm going to try to lay a, a broad picture for you and give you some things to think about. But most importantly, I really want to contextualize this discussion and this, this area, these areas, because I think uh, without context, uh, we can be misguided in our understanding and also in the way that we go about thinking about um, trying to, um, uh, to treat, intervene, and, and to heal some of these community members who may be uh, enduring some of these issues. And I really, I, 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 I tend to view, try to view everything um, as much as possible from strength-based perspectives. Uh, not that I'm um, saying that particular behaviors are okay or that they're um, that, that, that we should allow them to continue but I think we have to we have to change the way that we start viewing uh, certain um, problematic behaviors and trying to understand them in different ways I think to be successful in our in our healing processes uh, ultimately and so so I'm going to try to lay this out a little bit for you um, in the next half hour 35 minutes I'm gonna, I'm going to try to stop with about you know, 10 or so minutes uh, so that you can answer, uh, so I can answer maybe any questions you might have. Uh, let's see. I'm not able to change this. Let me see. Oh, there we go. Did you change it? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, okay. Um, I have this, this image here, no human being is illegal. Uh, and I think it's important because when I think about uh, the contributing factors to um, you know how we as Latino communities uh, potentially uh, understand who we are, um, understand who we are in the context of where we find ourselves, uh, and and then really begin to cope, adapt, adjust to the context in which we find ourselves. 
I, I think the the the, the macro uh, messages uh, and the the larger socio-cultural and political messages uh, play a huge role in that. And, and so, you know, one of the pre-poll questions was on historical and intergenerational trauma. You know, I'll, I'll cover a slide in a second that uh, that addresses that um, to a certain degree. Um, but what we know is that you know. Um, that racism, discrimination, and 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 how we and, and if we're viewed negatively, um, that that impacts uh, how we uh, respond and feel and adjust both physically and psychologically. I think that's been pretty consistently shown for for many decades now in the literature uh, around um, you know health and well-being. Uh, and so you know we 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 cannot under uh, underestimate the role that our context and macro messages plays in the lives of Latino communities. In particular today, with all the political rhetoric happening uh, in, in the world today, uh, it's, it's definitely impacting the, the, the physical and psychological health of our communities. Um, Stress-based theories of health have argued that, you know, simply our ethnicity or where we may find ourselves on this racial-ethnic continuum uh, has in some ways uh, created some uh, risk for us with regards to health and mental health outcomes. Um, as I mentioned, racism, discrimination, lack of access to resources at times, uh, and other sources of stress uh, certainly um, uh, can present with social disadvantages. And I say can present because um, it, we, we, you know, the, the the literature. We certainly there are certainly uh, things that impact us. But the literature also talks about really a, a number of things that also um, uh, serve as protective factors that, that really serve as, as uh, methods of resiliency for our communities as well. And I'm going to talk about that um, in a little bit as well. But the relationship between substance abuse and trauma is, is complex. I mean, you know, when we talk about the literature, you, again, you see some differences in findings there. And a lot of that has to do with the, the nature of the study and the research being conducted. A lot of it has to do with how acculturation and the culture rate of stress is being measured and, and identified. And so, you know, all those, all those nuances and variables certainly impact research outcomes. Um, but what, we, what, what some of the literature says is that substances and, and other types of unhealthy and problematic behaviors can be used as a way to cope with past experiences of trauma, current experiences of trauma. Um, uh, which also, in, in, in essence, what we know is that when, when, when when, when folks start to adjust and adapt by using substances or other kinds of uh, coping mechanisms that may not be healthy, that contributes to additional traumas in their lives. Uh, and we know that, that that happens. And many Latino communities and family members are, are what, what, what some of the literature has called multi-problem families. So it's not just one thing that they're coming in with, but we come in with multiple types of, of circumstances and challenges that um, uh, that we uh, that we need to try to sort through and address in some ways. Obviously, substance abuse uh, can be one of those issues. Um, so I think you know we have to contextualize this discussion. Um, as I mentioned, you know historical trauma is has has his, has you know uh, has uh, historically been written uh, in in many ways as relating to Native American communities um, for some time and even African American communities. More and more, we see it really being talked a lot about with Latino communities, Mexican, Mexican-American communities, particularly here in the United States. And I think there's relevance there because when you look at the the, the historical traumas um, that at this point we are um, we are we are moving through and continuing to deal with the residual effects of, uh, we 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 can't un we can't underestimate the impact that's having across. Um, you know the lifespan and across generations um, that that that's continuing to impact our communities today, particularly our youth. You know uh, there there was a study that was done by the uh, the National Fatherhood Council. I'm forgetting it's in my PowerPoint a little bit later, but there was a study that was done where they talked about um, you know uh, supplementing bootstraps for root straps and this this notion of you know staying connected and uh, valuing who we are ethnically culturally. Uh, certainly serves as protective factors and a source of resiliency to combat some of the uh, contextual challenges and messages that we receive about uh, many Latino communities and individuals in those communities. And so I think historical trauma and intergenerational trauma 
uh, certainly has played a role in, uh, in, in our coping and adaptation to our current context and circumstances. Um, which we which we need to, which we need to keep into, into take into consideration when trying to understand an, an, uh, uh, an individual's behavior. I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, I'll refer to uh, Martin Barro and his positivist psychology and, and the limitations in that, if you will. I'm going to briefly touch on just you know immigration. I think you know many of you are working with these communities and. Um, you know that uh, we, there is no one uh, Latina, Latino immigrant experience. Um, our, our, our immigration to the United States and, and who's immigrating to the United States are as diverse as you know, um, the, the, the communities within the, the larger umbrella term Latino and Latina. And so uh, we cannot assume that all our experiences are the same. We, we immigrate for uh, diverse reasons. Um, there was some research conducted where recently that found that uh, some of the more common reasons were a desire for better civil and legal rights, better benefits or opportunities, family-related reasons, having a home in the U.S., and desiring an Amer a quote-unquote American identity, which is interesting. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, but uh, this notion of being identified with and associating with uh, American identity is, is interesting. Um, you know, th there's also this more recent issue. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's more recent or we're just talking about it more today than we have over the past you know several years. But the unaccompanied minors and the trauma that those individuals are experiencing, both pre-migration, during migration, and post-migration, and adjustment is is unbelievable, and it's 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 hard to imagine that, the, that unless there are uh, services and resources and, and enough um, uh, of a support system in place and network in place, that, 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 that tr those multiple traumas are not going to impact some of those individuals. Um, and, and when we think about um, where we find ourselves oftentimes, not all Latino communities, but where some Latino communities find themselves here in the United States, we're socially stratified. There's no question about that, that, that there's a, a stratification system in the U.S. that has in some ways um, strategically uh, placed certain communities in certain areas uh, in order to maintain power, already existing power structures and status quo. And that certainly plays into this, uh, this issue around access to resources. Uh, what, what do we have access to? Um, you know, I don't. When I go to the the barrio and and to some of the communities that I work with here in Southern California, you know, unfortunately, I'm not finding a Whole Foods on every corner of of the barrio, or you know, a, a health food store, or whatever it may. Be. You know, I'm finding that there are fast food restaurants. I'm finding that there are liquor stores. You know, and so this is all part of our contextual. We have to contextualize this to really understand. Not only are we enduring, and at times, messages that negatively talk about who we are and what our role is here in the United States, but then we're also stratified in, in, in many ways in places where what we have access to um, uh, really is limited. And, and so then we end up relying potentially sometimes on, on, uh, on uh, un unhealthy uh, coping and adaptive uh, strategies at times. And so. Um, what's fascinating, though, is that um, recent and newly recent immigrants to the United States um, versus those U.S.-born Latino, Latina individuals, and, and when you know, depending on when they immigrate to the United States, the United States their their overall health and well-being actually differs substantially. So when we look at U.S.-born um, you know Latino Im individuals versus foreign-born and immigrated Latino individuals. There's a sense of there's a there's a desire and a sense of more uh, of wanting to be more connected uh, to their social context, invested uh, in their in their environments uh, more so than U.S. born Latino individuals are at, at times. Now this you know again we want to be careful we're not generalizing, but so there's something to say about um, you know the, the the resiliency that recent immigrants bring to the United States. What we also know is that over time though some of those behaviors begin to change. So there's, some, uh, there's been a lot of research for many years now that has said the longer we are in the United States, the poorer our health outcomes are, both physical and mental health. And so there's something to be said about that. 
and I'll come back to that uh, as well in just a few minutes. So again, just here's some here's some background information around why we're why we might be potentially immigrating uh, and under what circumstances, and then obviously the notion of xenophobia and, and how that's impacting many of us today. Um, you know, the the New York Times had a, a an, an article a few years ago that um the that they reported on the growing body of mortality research on immigrants to the United States demonstrate that the longer we live in this country, the worse our rates of heart disease, high blood pressure, and diabetes are. Okay, and so there's some there there is there there is some we can I think uh, begin to say with some confidence, and I think we've said this for some time that there are definitely correlations ar around. Um, you know how we are perceived and responded to, and how we ultimately end up adapt. Interesting enough, the report went on to state that while American-born children of immigrants may have more money, they tend to live shorter lives than their parents. And so, again, you know, context, environmental context, seems to be playing a role uh, in this in this process and in our processes. Um, uh, and so what's interesting is that th there's this paradox that happens with, it's called the Hispanic Latina Latino paradox, which I'll come to in, in, in a little bit, around that, you know, given all the mortality research, we, should be li we shouldn't be living as long as we are, but yet many of us are. And so why is that? And that's important. So let's look at acculturation and acculturative stress just for a few minutes here. Um, you know, again, I, I think... One of the things that I've also I've been a little bit uh, always concerned about is I think sometimes the literature has uh, made synonymous acculturation with assimilation. Uh, you know, assimilation is an out is one of the outcomes of of the of of a acculturative processes, but it certainly isn't the only outcome. And, and so I, I think the literature at times has has uh, mistakenly referred to assimilation as acculturation as assimilation and so I think we even have to be careful how we talk about it uh, how it's framed and, and how it's presented in the literature but acculturation is, is this process where um, uh, a cultural group attempts to exist within the larger host cultural group it doesn't mean that we have to uh, give up everything that we are and who we are although that can happen um, but uh, uh, Miranda talks about uh, uh, this culture, culture learning and behavioral adaptation that takes place as exposure to a non-native culture. And so acculturation at its best is, 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 is really, I think, somewhat of a neutral process uh, at times where both, are, where both cultures are being impacted by each other. Um, now, that doesn't always happen, as we know. Again, one outcome of acculturative processes is assimilation. Uh, and assimilation refers to the adoption of the new culture while abandoning our adherence and connection to our own native culture, in essence. And so I think what we see a lot of times is that there, there is, you know, in the United States today more than ever, there, there are certainly messages both, um, both directly and indirectly, consciously, unconsciously, that, that talk about our need to adapt and assimilate to U.S. culture. Uh, and, and, you know, whether it's an English-only law or whether it's, you know, um, uh, you know, trying to keep certain immigrants out of the country for, for, for many different reasons, there, there is a process of uh, needing to adapt to, and whether it's said or not said, the implication is um, needing to, to, to relinquish aspects of who we are in order to best, in order to best adjust to U.S. Uh, uh, U.S. norms and, and values, if you will, uh, and we know that 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 that's partly where the issues come and where the challenges come for many Latino community members. Where where when we start to move away from who we are ethnically and culturally, that's where we, that's where the literature has been, uh, I think, fairly consistent around uh, our outcomes uh, can can really be, I think, um, uh, more challenged in, in any ways, and so in many ways. And so the assimilation can look like, you know, learning English. And, and again, learning English doesn't necessarily mean one is um, uh, abandoning their cultural uh, uh, connection and ethnic background and identity, uh, but it certainly can imply that in some ways. Foregoing typical cultural traditions, uh, maybe resisting family involvement and surrounding oneself with non-Latino, uh, Latino peers. And so there's, you, you see this, this these potentially outcomes when someone's trying to move away from 
uh, who we are and where we come from. So there's a lot of pressure to adapt to a new culture that can be a heavy burden and really produce a, a lot of stress. And, um, and, and, and what we know, part of the issue is that no matter how much many of us may try to adapt to U.S. Uh, culture and norms and values, we are still not seen as uh, a, a part of, at times, U.S. culture and values. So, so many of us, while, me, while, while, while many of us may try to adapt, we're still never fully accepted, and that can create some, some challenges along the way. A culturative, and by the way, the process of acculturation is not just limited or relegated to only those who immigrate to the United States. It is, it is also relevant and, and meaningful for U.S.-born uh, Latina, Latino individuals as well. There is an acculturative process that happens for many of us as well who were born here in the United States. And so acculturation and acculturative stress happens both for U.S.-born individuals and also those who immigrate to the United States. Acculturative stress, uh, I, I was watching, um, I was showing a video from my class the other day, and, and I had an individual who described it as like it's like jumping into a um, a, a, a cold uh, ice uh, pool, if you will. It's like or taking a, a a shower that's ice cold. It's like you know, it's like everything just hits you all at once. It's like this idea of culture shock, if you will. And and acculturative stress has been identified as these negative side effects of the acculturative processes, such as trauma, anxiety, uh, disorientation. And we know that there has been some uh, some processes like that that have been related to acculturative stress that may link to um, the use of substances as well, the stress, the, the adaptation, and trying to negotiate um, those processes uh, is, I think, a, a challenge oftentimes. And so, uh, again, I mentioned this, um, acculturative stress can, might be associated with both U.S.-born um, Latino and U.S. cultural orientations. And what this essentially means is that there's been studies that, that have looked at um, how much one identifies with their Latino ethnic background and, and identity versus a U.S. Uh, uh, cultural identity and orientation. Um, and so the research has been somewhat quite interesting in this. And so they said that um, high levels of, of Latina, Latino culture orientation might be most strongly associated with acculturated stress. So in some ways, um, what that's saying is that um, the more we, we stick with, at times, who we are and value those things, the more stress we may experience. So the more we try and retain our cultural values, our ethnic pride, and manifest those in our daily lives through our behaviors, costumbres, etc., that, that some way, in some ways that may actually present some, uh, some challenges to us as we negotiate uh, U.S.-based society and culture, if you will. Um, Acculturate, acculturation stress, strain theory also, I wanted to make reference to this, it emphasizes the importance of stressful situations related to adaptation to a whole culture. So it's essentially uh, really talking specifically about acculturative stress. Um, the development of problem behaviors such as binge drinking can be the result of, of stress-inducing factors that increases an individual's vulnerability to, to problem behaviors. And I'm going to come back to that because there's been some interesting literature around that. Uh, let me try and change my slide. I can't do it again. Um, let me see. Uh, hmm. Let's see. I'm trying to change the next slide, and uh, I'm stuck. Do you want to make me the presenter, and I'll handle it from here? Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, let me do that. Let me do that. Yeah. I'm not sure why it's uh, doing that, but let's try this again. You have it now, Let us Yeah. Mm, yes. Okay. Cool. On yeah, one more slide. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, back one. Back one. If you will. Just let me just finish this. Um. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. I've covered some of this already. Um, um, I mentioned bullet point two. Um, you know, there, there, obviously, there are challenges that, that challenges that recent immigrants face 
you know, in coming to the United States, cultural differences, language barriers, maybe even dealing with financial challenges, um, but also uh, Latinos, Latinas who reside here in the U.S. for longer periods of time, um, many of us may be likely to experience greater levels of racial and ethnic discrimination given our status uh, within host culture. And we, we've, we've been talking about this for a long time, and I think that's relevant in, in our discussion around the development of uh, problematic behaviors, et cetera. And so, you know, the cumulative effects of all this stress um, uh, can really be, uh, can really lead to, to, you know, potentially substance use, coping mechanisms that may not be healthy, dietary uh, habits, et cetera, that may be challenges. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, Gil talks that, you know, this is particularly true when our personal resources are not there, when our social resources are not there in many ways. And um, what was interesting about this, the, the, the last two bullet points, that's why I said I wanted to come back to the binge drinking piece. Um, they, they looked, uh, in this particular study, they, they examined what they identified as two acculturation variables and their relationship to binge drinking. And the two acculturation variables were amount of time in the U.S. and language spoken at home. And interesting enough, in the pre-poll question, it was interesting because about 60-something percent of you said that if people speak Spanish at home with their parents, that they're less likely to, to, you know, to use illicit drugs, marijuana, et cetera. Some research has found that, but then, of course, there's this research, in essence, uh, that says, look, 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 it's not so much about, uh, at least in this study, amount of time in the U.S. or language spoken at home that, that really determined um, a potentially binge drinking behaviors. But what was, what was a more determining variable or factor was previous exposure to alcohol use. So that was really a more of a determining factor than amount of time in the U.S. and or language spoken at home with regards to acculturation. So again, you know, they're, they're, I think it's a multifaceted, multi-complex ish, com uh, complex issue that we have to really dissect and further delineate some of the, the nuances regarding this, you know, the, the, the correlations. We certainly can't say if this, then that, the cause and effect. I think we can talk about certainly correlations in these discussions, but I'm not sure that we can definitively define certain uh, cause and effects um, you know, for, for some of these the issues that we're talking about here. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Okay, uh, one more. So, uh, you know, we, this was uh, back one, that is, back one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so uh, we mentioned this in one of the pre-poll questions that historical trauma, and I mentioned it again, certainly has impact has impacted us in many ways. SAMHSA talked about this recently and, and, and its association with substance abuse, domestic violence, child abuse, and suicide. And, and I think what, what, what I'm really trying to get at and I, what I really want to, one of the messages I want to I get at today is that I think when we look at this literature and we look at findings like this, I think one of the takeaways for many people, many individuals, is that that this is just part of who we are as a culture. Like this is just who Latinos are, or this is you know uh, substance abuse is a huge issue in Native American communities, and so that's just part of their culture, or that's part of Latino culture. And and that I think is a is a misguided interpretation and understanding uh, because we're 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 not taking into consideration all the other surrounding variables and circumstances and context that I think impact, uh, you know, how that becomes part of how we learn to cope and adapt at times to the environments in which we found, find ourselves. So I think I'm really wanting to shift how we, how we talk about that and how we think about that. Um, so, you know, again, the second bullet point talks about in, in comparing foreign and U.S. born Mexican Americans, the acculturation research has indicated that being born in the U.S has been shown to be a risk factor for alcohol dependence, actually, um, and that Latinos that are born or in or residing in the U.S. for 15 years or, or more have also been found uh, to be associated with increased alcohol use. So again, if we go back to my earlier slides where I talked about the macro messages or, you know, talking about Latino immigrants as illegal immigrants, nobody's illegal, no human being is illegal, our terminology, our language, the way that we categorize, label, uh, uh, make sense of can be very dehumanizing in our processes at, at times. And so, um, so I think over time, the longer we're here, I, I think that we see the impact, the, the, the negative effects that those 
that those societal perspectives and, and ideologies, how they impact and, and create stress and, and weigh on many of us and in, 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 in our Latino community members. Um, uh, the, this other piece of research just reaffirmed the earlier research that um, you know, 15 years or longer increased alcohol use. Um, you know, well, um, we, we there's also some research that showed that individuals who uh, use alcohol and illicit drugs uh, have experienced some kind of trauma at some point in their lives, either as a child or an adult. Uh, and this obviously includes uh, men and women from various racial and ethnic backgrounds, including Latino communities. Can we go to the next slide? Um, uh, this is, these are just some general health statistics which I thought, which I thought were interesting to put in here. Um, again, higher acculturation, I think this also means in some ways higher assimilation uh, it has meant more substance abuse uh, concerns, uh, maybe sexual risk behaviors, dietary concerns, uh, poorer work, uh, birth outcomes, worse birth outcomes. Um, uh, interestingly, uh, bullet points three talks about when we arrive to the United States, um, if we arrive after the, this study found that if we arrived after the age of six, that we have a lower risk for depressive disorders than those who arrived prior to the age of six. Uh, interesting finding. Um, uh, immigrants from Mexico have also shown a, a lower prevalence for alcohol abuse, major depression, and phobias than U.S. born Mexican Americans. We'll go to the next slide. Um, interesting, Latinas are more likely to abstain, at least in this research study, to abstain from the use of alcohol or illicit drugs compared to Latinos. Men are men, and I think this has to do with a lot of gender socialization and uh, what, are, what are the roles, and, and I think that's changing in many of our Latino communities. I don't know that we're adhering so much anymore to the traditional gen gender stereotypes. You know, for years people thought this notion of machismo and, and being machista was somehow, uh, that, that was something that we owned as communities, that that was our thing, that, that that was only relevant to us. And there's been research that has demonstrated that that is not the case, actually, that, that men across multiple ethnic and racial communities demonstrate some of the more negative gender socialization stereotypes um, as much as anybody else does. And so it's not just something that is relegated to Latino communities. In fact, actually, there's been, there's been some studies that have demonstrated that um, Latin, many Latino men demonstrate those more positive, this idea of uh, caballerismo, this, this, this being a, a, a gentleman, and that, that we also demonstrate those characteristics as much as, as anybody else does. I do think, though, that we as men, um, aren't as well equipped and have as many adaptive coping strategies and resources as our women do uh, in, our, in our communities. And I think that certainly has a role in, in our, in our uh, coping mechanisms that we choose in many ways. Um, again, some of the, the, uh, the statistics are things that I've already talked about um, that I'm not going to go over uh, in too much detail. Can we go to the next slide, uh, Daddy, please? Thank you. Um, yeah, so again, let's go to this, this paradox. Um, despite all this, I just have a few minutes left. Despite all this, we are, um, we're, we're, we're actually outliving folks. Can we go to the next slide? So there are, there are cultural factors that help us in, in terms of uh, really adapting and adjusting to, to our context. And I mentioned this Hispanic, Latino, Latino paradox that talks about that, you know, given our, 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 our challenges, socially, uh, economically, environmentally, um, that we shouldn't be necessarily living as long as we are, and yet we are in, in many ways. Research has demonstrated that. Can we go to the next slide? So what's contributing to these things? So um, if you look at, this is just some statistics for you um, that, that talks about that cultural values have been demonstrated to be a source of protective factors in the development of resiliency, and so if you look at the data here, this is from 2012. Um, you know, we we're, we are outliving other communities that that um, are also that you know some of them are dealing with the same issues that we are. So, what's helping us? Let's go to the next slide. So um, uh, we know that I, I mentioned this earlier that you know um, this this notion of the value advantage. There was some research that that that, that they found that said that living in neighborhoods with people who look like us, talk like us, 
come from the same backgrounds that we do, may, maybe share some of the same values that we do, has actually uh, shown to be uh, an advantage to our health. Uh, at the same time, there's other literature that has shown that it's also been shown to be a challenge for us when we try to exist in other environments and contexts uh, outside of those. So, so I think, you know, there are advantages and there are some challenges with that, but, but there is something to be said around uh, existing with people who, who validate and mirror who you are uh, and that that you know there are many of us who grew, who've grown up in communities where it's like we I didn't know we didn't know I, we didn't know we were poor or we di I didn't know that being brown was not was not this or that because everyone I was around uh, affirmed that in some ways or everyone was I around came from the same socioeconomic background and so there 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 are those processes that well that serve as protective factors against some of the outside negative messages and forces that try to impinge upon our, our self-worth, if you will. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, this is, this is really interesting research around looking at native-born and immigrant-born, uh, I mean, immigrant um, uh, first-generation academic outcomes and um, standardized scores. And, and so what it says is that oftentimes first-generation immigrants are doing better academically than our second and third generations are in, in school, actually. And so, again, that ties back to some of the things that I mentioned earlier around context and, and environment and whatnot. Next slide. Again, some of this will vary from community to community. Um, uh, studies have shown that with immigrant Latinos that, that the more involvement we are with our ethnic culture, somehow that, bear, that buffers against depression. Uh, and the more we assimilate, the more depressed we get. Uh, again, this study was bullet point two was the study that found that Latino youth who speak Spanish with their parents are less likely to smoke marijuana and use other drugs. Again, there was contradictory research to that earlier. So I think you know we have to take this in in context and and that there might be something around retaining cultural values, including language, that serves us well. And I think there's been a sufficient amount of literature that has talked about that the retention of language, and other uh, cultural uh, customs and values certainly has played a, a strong role in, in our self-worth and value and, and, and our ultimate outcomes in, in essence. So um, next slide. Um, again, this is talking about a strong ethnic identity has been shown to buffer against discriminatory experiences in the, in the host culture, protect, uh, has been shown as a protective factor for minority youth and also been linked to positive self-esteem and academic outcomes. Okay, next slide. Okay, keep going. Again, uh, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna um, sum the, summarize these the, 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 these cultural values of family. You know, what's interesting around this notion of uh, familia is that um, you know we know that as much as familia and this notion of familismo can be a protective factor. We also know that it can also be a risk factor. So with most things that we talk about, um, we, we, have to, we have to contextualize them, as I've mentioned. So there, the cultural values that we see in the literature around family, around being together, being connected, uh, no matter what our circumstances are, if we are in, in connected and, and we have a supportive environment um, and we're working towards the same thing, that has been shown to buffer against some of these uh, negative psychological uh, effects that, that impact us. Okay, keep going. Uh, yeah, so again, I, I mentioned this, I'm going to mention the last, uh, this last um, bullet point here where I talked about root straps, not bootstraps. The National Latino Fatherhood and Family Institute um, had a brown paper that they did where they, they talked about threats to negative self-concept are buffered through the individual increasing their connectedness to ethnic group membership, which is shown to increase personal worth for the individual. And so I think we, we, we can certainly say that valuing and retaining who we are as, a, as an ethnic and cultural community, we, we know that some adaptation to U.S. host society can serve us well, actually. That, that, that's not, I'm not in some ways trying to insinuate that we shouldn't uh, 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 integrate, if you will, some of those uh, values, but we shouldn't lose. I'm a proponent that we should not lose who we are culturally and ethnically because I, I do feel like that impacts us and can lead to some 
traumatic and and uh, poor coping mechanisms. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, next slide. So I want to. This these are my last couple of slides here. I meant I, this was in the, the one of the pre poll questions. Um, Prilitinsky has argued, and his colleagues have argued that that for wellness to occur, for healing to occur, that it must occur on three different domains, if you will, the personal, the relational, and the collective. So, for example, uh, justice and wellness are intimately connected to each other. It is a, one cannot exist without the other. I cannot heal somebody in in a in an isolated environment. Send them back out to the environment in which it in which there it created some of the distress to begin with, and think that I have sufficiently satisfied my role in, in trying to help them adjust and adapt and move through whatever that they're dealing with. And so there, there is, I think, our roles as uh, providers, whether it's in, in a social worker, an MFT, a psychologist, counselor, whatever it may be, and our roles as researchers and academics needs to include these, the, the contextual environmental uh, uh, variables in understanding, number one, what creates uh, unhealthy outcomes for us, and then also uh, what heals us in many ways. So Prilatinsky has outlined these different domains that I think are critical, and each one of those supports and relies on the other. They do not compensate for the other. So if you uh, achieve personal growth, that cannot outweigh the societal factors affecting our health. We have to intervene and think about what that means to, uh, to heal someone. Um, our work is political, and, and, and it should be seen as such. Uh, Aristotle called us political animals, and, and you know, it's like we cannot separate ourselves from the context in which we find ourselves, even as providers and researchers uh, in the mental health fields and disciplines. It is a cultural, political process that I think needs to be understood in order for healing and wellness to occur, particularly today in the year 2016. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm, an, I'm not going to go over, I, I already covered some of this, and I'm, I'm not going to go over this in detail because uh, some of this is a repeat. Uh, can you go to the next slide, though? I want to highlight um, uh, Martin Bottles' actually um, uh, uh, con concept of positivist psychology. Um, some of this, this uh, post-colonial analysis is really, really talking about that, again, what I mentioned to you. We have to simultaneously account for current and historical repercussions of oppressive forces, including sexism, racism, homophobia, ex classism, et cetera, and how that impacts the issues that we're trying to, uh, to deal with and to address in many ways. Okay, keep going. Okay, la uh, keep going. I'm going to take another minute or here. So, so what does this mean for us? I, you know, we, we need to, to continue to develop critical consciousness as a role, as a foundation for us not to replicate some of the oppressive practices within the work that we do. You know, I think um, our work as uh, mental health providers, counselors, researchers, et cetera, um, is founded upon, uh, is grounded in, in cultural concepts and, and is grounded in cultural values that are oftentimes inconsistent with those who we're trying to implement them with, particularly Latino communities. And so we need to understand that. And critical consciousness does not always mean uh, thinking of something as a negative thing as much as it means thinking about uh, what are the implications of using something within a certain context with certain communities at this particular moment in time. And does it make sense or do we need to do things differently to address the issue that we're trying to, uh, to understand? And so we need to understand the socio-political context. Research has consistently demonstrated that Latino families heal in connection uh, and collectively and become more symptomatic in isolation. Okay? My next slide. And this is my last slide. And I will stop at this and, and try to give a few minutes for questions. So I, I want to end with this because I think it's important around shifting our perspective a little bit. So Martin Bado, who... Um, who, who often is, is uh, credited with uh, this, the father of, um, you know, uh, this liberation psychology, this uh, uh, process, I think, and, 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 and application of it, and, and even in today is, I think, very relevant in our work, particularly with Latino communities. He states that psychological theories based on a positivist perspectives 
focus only on what can be seen and measured and leave out possibilities contained in the person, context, situation, dynamic. So example, a Latino, quote unquote, Latino substance abuser from a positivist perspective is simply manifesting hyper-masculine behaviors or simply manifesting what many would erroneously deem to be cultural practices. What it does, doing that, it leaves out our, the complexity of, of the essence of who or the being of who this individual is, how their historical, social, and economic factors may affect his or her role as someone who uses substances. And so, you know, again, I'm not condoning and saying, hey, this is, these behaviors are okay, that these are okay for us to do. Quite, con quite the contrary. Quite the contrary. I'm actually saying, look, they're not okay, but how can we understand them in a way that's going to help us best adjust and, ad and address the issue at hand? So a, a contextual and dialectical approach would mean that we explore the factors that maintain and support problematic behaviors and attitudes while also exploring the possibilities for change. Okay, and, that, and um, my last slide has my contact information on it. I know I tried to squeeze in a lot in a very limited amount of time, um, but if there are any questions in the last few minutes, uh, I'm happy to, uh, to, to answer any of them. Again, my, point, my, my goal today was to lay some background, but try to contextualize it and also think about um, uh, continuing to, to, to expand how we think about this, these issues and their intersection. Thank you so much. I hope you found that helpful. Thank you, Dr. Gallardo. Um, we have a few questions, so let me get those. Okay, I can't see them right now. Uh, let me no, see you them. won't see them. I, I'll, I'll okay. tell you. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so you touched upon a lot about being born in the U.S. being a risk factor. Um, do you feel that carries over to other minority groups as well because of having to go with racism, discrimination, etc.? An interesting argument for racism to be included in the DSM. Absolutely, most definitely. And in fact, I think our PTSD uh, criteria and conceptualization is way too limited. And, and inadequate. In fact, there's been research that has been conducted on the role of racism and the, and the traumatic impact that it has. In fact, there was a study that was done with African American women who were in intimate partner relationships, and when they interviewed these women, they asked them why they didn't call the police or go to an authority, and these women said that, that calling the police or calling an authority like that they did not want to endure the negative perceptions and reactions that they thought they would encounter in doing so, and that they would rather endure being in the um, the uh, intimate partner relate violent relationship than call uh, the police or some authoritative figure. And so that that I think that I think really captures the impact that discrimination, racism has on multiple communities, and you know this whole. Uh, this whole issue around police and killing black individuals today, I, I think, is uh, I think uh, a poignant and powerful example of why many communities may not see certain uh, systems and resources in society as advantageous or on their side. And so, I think that study really el illustrated absolutely racism. Uh, is a traumatic experience for many of us, and it should be. And in fact, I talk about that um, as a as a, a, a post-traumatic uh, stress uh, reaction and impact. So I think we definitely need to expand our perspective on that as well, for sure. Thank you. Um, another question: um, Speaking about acculturative stress and acculturation gaps, do you have any recommendations for clinicians working with adolescents? may be experiencing acculturation gaps within their family. Yeah, I mean, good question. I, you know, a lot of that, a lot, I, I, I know the answer people don't like is it depends, but I, I mean, I think some of it depends on, on the, the, the nature of the relationships they have with their family and what that looks like. I think if family is, is, a, is a potential resource, then I think obviously including 
family. Uh, again, remember, I, I think we have to think about, you know, when we go back to Prilatinsky and his colleagues' domains for healing, most of us, most of our work is dealing with the personal domain, the individual domain, and the, and the, the social factors become second-class interventions oftentimes. So why that's important is because I feel like we, we, we shouldn't think about healing individuals in isolation of the context in which they find themselves. And so I think even for adolescents, how can we help connect them to something greater and larger than themselves in the process of their healing? So that could be with family, with their family or some members of their family. It could be with uh, some other context in which they may find themselves. So I think we have to think about the healing process in connection to the larger uh, c personal, relational, and collective domains to be successful. Uh, and so I think, and then the other thing I would say is that simultaneously, we want to, I, I, again, I mentioned this, I'm a proponent about affirming and, 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 and helping people embrace who they are ethnically and culturally. There's, there's no question about it to me. If that's a value to somebody and that's meaningful for someone, I think that we need to embrace that and help them uh, uh, give voice to that for themselves and take ownership of that because I, I do find that that serves as a protective factor. The other thing I would say, and the last thing I would say in this question is that resiliency is not something that we are born with necessarily. Resiliency can be developed. Resiliency can be grown. Resiliency can be um, uh, uh, nurtured and 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 um, and emphasized and and you know uh, multiplied, if you will. And so, uh, so I think you know we we need to think about how we can help, what that means for the adolescent, and what that looks like for them. But I can't emphasize enough: healing should not be seen as an isolating process, particularly for many Latino community members. Thank you so much. Okay. So I think that's it for questions for now. Um, so again, I would like to thank our presenter, Dr. Gallardo, for your time and for an excellent presentation. Just a reminder for our participants, our recording of today's webinar and PowerPoint slides will be posted at our, at our website, and they will be available at www.attcnetwork.org slash Hispanic Latino. And another reminder that we have our symposium next week, Immigration, Trauma, and Substance Use, the Latino Journey to the U.S. So if you would like to know more about this event, um, you can email us and you have our link to register as well. That will be next week on Thursday, October 6th at the University of Southern California. And I, I will also be there at that as well. Yes, and Dr. Gallardo will be there as one of our presenters. So this concludes today's webinar. Um, if you're interested in receiving further training on this topic, remember to email us. And also, um, if you can go to the symposium, you can learn more about the topic. As you leave today's webinar, you'll be redirected to complete a brief survey about your experience. Your feedback is very important to us, and we appreciate you taking the time to tell us what you thought about today's webinar. So thank you, everybody. Gracias. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.